Cool. So, um, yeah, uh, Jeff, um, this is Hagulian, Harry Hagulian. Yeah, we have, we have, uh, <laughs> we have interacted on Twitter and uh, DM'd, I believe. So it's That's a right. pleasure to, uh, pleasure to talk. Yeah, he's joining us a bit uh, late, and he's always really good about that because he, he's sort of an outlier on the, um, the Western spectrum of time zone discourse, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So cool. Um, so I guess, you know, my idea was kind of a generic um, year in review type of thing. And, uh, you know, the way to approach that is movies of the year. Um, mm. uh, I don't even bother with music. I, I sort of feel like it's a little culturally uh, exhausted, weirdly. You know, it's not like you can go back. Oh, that was the album. I feel like more and more you have to be in the industry to really kind of feel that zeitgeist as far as music being as important as it once was. So, so we got movies, just sort of events, political events. Um, I uh, just sort of noted that uh, the movie of the year pre-pandemic, I feel, was Joker. You know, the end of 2019, Joker was, you know, a big deal. And then we go into this weird kind of hibernation and then coming out of the post the pandemic, post-pandemic movie of the year, Top Gun Maverick. What a what a contrast, right? Yeah, I, that movie really, um, it's, it seems like such an outlier in so many respects. It's, uh, it's kind of surprising that it exists. But I, I mean, I suppose it's, you know, part of what's interesting about it is it, of course, continues the um, general trend of uh, revivals, nostalgia, you know, all of the significant cultural properties are from the 90s or earlier and just get rehashed but in general Top Gun Maverick was just a, a very a very good version of that and seemed to be extremely well liked by almost everyone who I have spoken to or read commentary from um, so it's a uh, it, it's it's kind of a remarkable achievement um, that that one doesn't see coming out of Hollywood much these days yeah you know it, they, they they really went out of their way to remove any kind of political red flags from it except for the kind of obvious background condition of it being a american triumphalist type of film um you know what we're triumphing over is a little bit vague but it actually sort right. of <laughs> speaks it's extreme to, extremely vague <laughs> right um east asia somewhere I, yeah. I i think that's about as much as i could gather i'm going to assume north yeah. korea i guess is probably the baddie in that um yeah yeah um, but yeah, it's the, the, the never ending 20th century or, you know, or at least things that are very clearly derived from the, the 20th century, you know, like even Predator gets some kind of maybe spinoff or, or, um, or the like, but it seems difficult to, to quit the 20th century. And I actually think that, uh, speaking of another movie that's fairly contemporary, Top Gun Maverick is quasi contemporary now. Uh, Avatar, Avatar, you know, say what you will, but actually it seems like something new on the block. Now, I know it's a sequel to the 2009 film, but, you know, relative to everything else that whose roots go even further back, I think Avatar is, represents something genuinely sort of new. And uh, I'm not that excited about animated films, but this one, I have a certain, I, I feel like there's an exception warranted here. Do you guys care about that film? Have you followed any of that? Um, for, for my part, um, I haven't actually seen any uh, Avatar um, of any kind. <laughs> haven't seen the first yeah. one. Um, haven't haven't caught anything of the you know the, the trailers or anything of the sequel. But um, I am a kind of quite fond of James Cameron's uh, earlier stuff. Um, of course, Terminator, Aliens, and I think Terminator Two as well, although it's not as it's not as a kind of remarkable maybe as the first Terminator, but I think Cameron was was um, kind of a visionary director in that sort of blockbuster um, blockbuster milieu. Yeah, he's sort of like the, the the film director version of Phil Collins. You know, a lot of people like the very very early stuff, and and frankly, with Phil Collins, it's probably you know, ninety nine percent about in the air tonight. But then everything else is just very you know, kind of saccharine and, and corny. 
uh, James Cameron is sort of like the <laughs> film version of, of Phil Collins, the way that his reputation is kind of perceived. But yeah, um, got the, yeah, the first Terminator, undeniably awesome. Um, and then it starts sort of its descent from there as far as, you know, everyone cool agreeing that, that it is just that cool. Right? The right. Abyss, interesting. Terminator 2, okay. You know, he, he had to add a kid and, and there's some kind of family-friendly dynamics going on there. You know, the dad he never had and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, technically it's still pretty impressive. I think I think Cameron's, you know, kind of vision is very kind of sleek, hyper-modern vision that he had in those kind of 80s and 90s films. There's sort of lots of cool blues, yeah, lots of metal, kind of reflective metal, um, these kind of hyper-modern environments. Uh, I think you especially see that in in Terminator 2, actually, and uh, I remember these scenes in the kind of mental hospital at the, at the beginning. Yeah. Um, kind of mechanical he... machine to everything. And the blue is almost certainly connected to his fascination with water, I would say. But... Right. I mean, I think I think he was, he was great at that. Yeah, he had that kind of futuristic vision. And I, I don't know how well that's kind of come through with uh, things like Avatar, but um, that that side of him i think is, is is you know really valuable um in terms of and he, he was kind of in i think he was a key he was a key kind of director in terms of um the 80s and, and what i call sort of neo-futurism um which i i sort of brought up this term in that piece which was quite successful that law law and order piece uh, where you kind of I, I sort of see the 70s producing what i call kind of queasy queasy futurism where you have all these kind of freudian overtones and there's something a bit kind of strange and a bit maybe kind of naff about it all really <laughs> in a way um you know think films like star trek motion picture um uh, you know these kind of spangly outfits and so on and then you get into the 80s with a different kind of futurism appears which is more which has more maybe in common spiritually with futurism of the, the 30s i think kind of hard-edged um, futurism and i think you can place top top gun in that as well you know, I, I kind of want to bring up two people I know are touchstones for Hegulian as well as myself. But, uh, you know, when I went to see Top Gun Maverick and rewatched the original, you know, it, it occurred to me you can really read Top Gun kind of alongside um, Ballard's Crash. You know, is this mm -hmm. this film about the kind of imbrication of the the body with this kind of, you know, metallic, monstrous machinery and you know the the way that these characters are you know part of the, and in a way part of the you know there's all of this kind of intense like homoeroticism of the film but you know the the eroticism of the film generally is kind of connected to the way these bodies are kind of inserted into these machines uh right. and, and you know and so and and then the other thing that's kind of interesting touching on another uh, just trying to hit your your um your uh, references that I that I share and appreciate, uh, you know, there's sort of a, a a clearly kind of Baudrillardian dimension of of Top Gun because, you know, basically there there are all these scenes that have to do with, uh, you know, where they're kind of uh, using these flight simulators and, you know, there's kind of this tension between the these classrooms at this naval academy where they're you know under they're uh, going through these uh, sophisticated simulations and then you know there's there to some extent there's this kind of reassertion of the human where it's like um, you know that the, the human is supposed to um, it, there's a struggle of the human subject to retain a certain autonomy over the simulation and the kind of machinery in which it's in which he is enmeshed and then you know this becomes even more explicit at the beginning of the the open of the first, uh, or sorry, of the new Top Gun, where you have uh, basically a sort of threat of automation. That's how you know Tom Cruise has become 
a sort of dinosaur. He's threatened with obsolescence, right? Um, and he, you know, he has to prove his um, continued value to the Navy, which is eager to simply um, replace, you know, him and those like him with drones, right? And so there's there's this whole kind of interesting uh, way that I, you can connect those films to all of these, um, you know, that, that are extremely sort of feel good and so on, but you can connect them to to Ballard, uh, to uh, the Terminator movies, because they all they all have this kind of um, a certain threat of human obsolescence or of human kind of absorption into into the machine um, hanging over them. And so the the sort of uh, proof of, you know, the, the the sort of great test that that the heroes undergo is partly, um, you know, this. And, and so I think part of what makes them triumphant is in a way not the triumph over these like somewhat vaguely painted Cold War and post Cold War enemies, but the uh, the triumph of a kind of um, autonomous human subject over the machines uh, that that he commands. Yeah, it's interesting in that movie. I'd, I'd forgotten about that angle where, you know, they, they paint him as anachronistic uh, in, in more ways than one. I think mean, they're, they're obviously hinting at the fact that, you know, the, the Top Gun franchise goes back to the 80s, so we can all laugh at how it's still around. But it also has this kind of um, neo-Luddite dimension where there's a, this fear that he will be rendered obsolete. And just like the uh, the 80s cliche of the, the cop on his, you know, his, his final day on duty, uh, you know, retirement never seems to come. You know, and, and somehow uh, Tom Cruise will not be rendered obsolete, even when he is fully a hologram, I suspect. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Baudrillard, and uh, it brought to mind, um, there's one one of the Cool Memories books, there's a fragment where he goes to a Stevie Wonder concert. <laughs> I don't know why exactly, but he goes to one. And, what was um, Sorry, which, which was uh, Baudrillard goes to Stevie Wonder concert. Yeah. Oh. One of his fragments in, in the book. Um, there's a series of books called Cool Memories where it's a kind of like, they're kind of like journals. And what what uh, strikes him uh, about the Stevie Wonder's music, so this would have been probably early 80s, is this kind of synthetic quality of it. And what he calls, he calls it a music of a pitiless technicity. So I, I, I kind of stuck in my mind this this expression. I thought that sort of sums up the 80s, really, especially aesthetically. Kind of like the whole West embraced this pitiless technicity. Yeah, where maybe in the 70s there's this kind of tension between um, you know kind of embracing the future and and wanting to remain sort of more human in a sense. And then in the 80s, you have all this kind of synth music. You have these movies like Top Gun, which are kind of just, you know, love letters to technology, in this case, military technology. And and the whole film has this very glossy kind of, yeah, techno eroticism, you might say. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there was kind of some kind of shift in the 80s um, in this kind of futurist direction which continues, I think. I think we are still in this kind of tra on this trajectory. Um, you know, you only have to look at how people respond to the the AI stuff, which is you know kind of being chucked out every day on Twitter. People marveling over you know these these AIs which are going to replace us, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, and, I, uh, I can't, uh, well, it, it's as far as the '80s, and uh, it's interesting to hear Top Gun as sort of a representative of the uh, fascination with technology and everything high tech and sleek because when it comes to that kind of aesthetic in, in music uh the kind of people most into you know synthesizer driven music in the 80s would not have liked a movie like top gun very much so but you know this far out <laughs> those sort of uh, intra you know status competition as far as what kind of movies are cool what kind of music is cool doesn't really uh, doesn't really matter so much you know you're making kind of a larger point um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's cool memories. That's a Baudrillard collection of books, you say? That's right. Yeah, there are five volumes. Um, great uh, music artist named Adam Hart, or now Atom TM, who also has a, um, an album called Cool Memories. I wonder if it's an allusion to that. Well, quite possibly, quite possibly, yeah. 
Um, oh, but about Top Gun Maverick, I think it kind of established, you know, this kind of new myth of based crews. Um, I, th I think maybe it cemented it rather than established it because because he's already already been kind of created as a, or, or re reinvented as a sort of right wing hero because of his participation in Eyes Wide Shut, yeah, which is which is seen you know on the right as some kind of message uh, from from Stanley Kubrick about about dastardly doings, dastardly going yeah. on. It's uh, weird in, to right wing now. You know, if someone like Tom Cruise is right wing, I feel they sort of or he drifted into it by default because maybe just just relative to increasingly outspoken and political actors. Um, I guess he is not exactly at the forefront of all of that. Um, now, he is a Scientologist, which would you'd think might prompt him to uh, be more political than he is in a way, but you don't really hear him talking too much about that. In fact, he's sort of weirdly reinvented himself. Back in the 2000s, he was a bit of a laughing stock, and then, I don't know, he's just... Uh, right. I guess it's more really impressive than everyone. Yeah, cool. I mean, I think he's also the last sort of Hollywood movie star of the old sort uh, who, still, who still has the, you know, who isn't over the hill, um, who still who still can play a sort of commanding uh, you know action hero as in as he did successfully in Top Gun Maverick. So you know it 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 seems like he really is kind of the last of of a line of a certain kind of leading man. And so you know that I think that means he and and again I I think it's I like how you kind of um, began with the the juxtaposition of Joker and Top Gun because the and Top Gun Maverick because they're really they really are opposites in a way because they, yeah, uh, they 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 manage to uh, achieve or or um, Top Gun Maverick manages to achieve this kind of, uh, you know, it, it it manages to achieve this kind of crossover. I mean, you know, it reminds me of I think, you know, this is kind of a remark that the Zizek has made about a number of different things that, you know, you know, you're in front of a really significant sort of ideological. Um, expression when it can sort of have this multiplicity of of meanings and functions, right? In a culture, it it um, you know I, I think Joker, uh, you know Joker was was sort of different from that. It, it was essentially, you know, it, it it seemed to basically function on two levels, right? One was that it it sort of generated this intense uh, culture war. Uh, backlash and then a sort of counter backlash. And, you know, to what extent that was part of its deliberate marketing, we don't really know. But, um, you know, certainly that kind of stuff goes through the minds of people uh, thinking about marketing these days. But, you know, it 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 didn't. Um, so it, and then it, and then it could sort of operate as this, you know, it, it could sort of meet the, the normie at the sort of level of of being part of a a you know DC Comics franchise, um, but so, so it could sort of function on those two levels approximately. Um, whereas you know Top Gun, I think somehow managed to it 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 achieved something quite remarkable. I, I think I said this before, but just just in being able to um, seemingly largely transcend the kind of usual culture war. Uh, framings that we find today and at the same time um, you know uh, function very well on the normie level and not not be experienced and perceived as as a kind of cynical sequel that's just cashing in on a pre-existing bit of IP but you know that that was conceived of that was that was perceived and experienced as something relatively fresh and um, and refreshing so it it had a kind of fascinating, Reception that I that you know I think suggests it 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 marks you know what it, it, I think it makes sense to think about it as the uh, as the the film of the year in in that respect in a way because it does seem to mark a certain a certain turn in the culture which I think is still a little bit difficult to to get one's head around but just intuitively I would almost connect it to the fact of you know. <clears throat> what what happened um, in these elections, like in the U.S. and you know in the fall? Well, basically, it was seen as this kind of um, 
testing ground for all of these kind of culture war issues. And, um, you know, it, it, it largely ended up with these very sort of ambiguous results. Um, and, you know, did seem to suggest that, um, that there's still a kind of lack of penetration of a lot of those issues on the sort of normie level. And, um, you know, th th there, there are things about that that are very, uh, I mean, there are things about what, what went down on that level that are discouraging that I wrote about for, for Compact um, in an essay called The Death of Popularism, but there are also things that are perhaps encouraging in the way that I sort of take the Top Gun movie to be ultimately more encouraging of a sign as far as the the um, the capacities of the culture than than I would have expected to see. But I don't know. I'm not usually this uh, I'm not usually this positive. I don't know what's what's come over me. <laughs> so it's funny, though, that uh, it seems to me that given how depressed pandemic era politics became, you know, the, the depths of late 2020, early 21, um, that seems like a ripe time for a movie such as Joker to come out, whereas Top Gun Maverick, you know, feels like it belongs in the, you know, relative to what came after, feel good 2010s. The 2010s feel to me like the new 90s in the sense that we can look back on it as kind of this uh, this golden age before the, uh, the worst parts of the 70s returned with a, a kind of, uh, you know, isolated digital futures sheen in the form of the 2020s. So a giant Top Gun Maverick feels like it belongs to the end of the 2010s, whereas Joker somewhat feels like it belongs now. But, you know, ironically, I guess Top Gun Maverick was supposed to be released in 2019 or 2020. Let's push back. They say it's a movie for, uh, you know, that, that the pandemic, people coming out of the pandemic need, but it wasn't supposed to be that way. But you know, it all shook out a certain way. Yeah, I think <clears throat> one big factor is uh, you know, the fact that so many films are just blatant propaganda now. Um, the Marvel movies, you know, uh, and, and people are just sick of it. I think a lot of a lot of people are just fed up of you know going to the cinema and, and basically being lectured uh, by by the filmmakers. And I think um, with with Maverick, there was that sense that it didn't have, you know, a kind of over message. Except, you know, isn't isn't this cool? You know, isn't don't don't we have a great military? Or you know, isn't isn't, isn't um, Tom Cruise, you know, a cool actor? Kind of kind of just those simple simple. Um, simple messages of the past, really, uh, kind of tapping in, I suppose, what we were talking about, I was talking about hauntology quite a bit, you know, my, my pieces on, on Substack, and it did capture something of that, and it was sort of a, a simpler time, you know, when, when you didn't have to worry so much about, you know, is, is the movie politically correct, is it, does it, does it tick all the boxes? Um, and I think that's what something that people found refreshing, really. Um, but you know, Hollywood plows on regardless, and they and they can keep churning out their, um, you know, their kind of propaganda pieces. Um, but it's kind of an unfortunate wedding of, you know, technical chop, technical impressiveness, VFX, and all of that, with the kind of often annoying progressive politics being smuggled in. It's it's hard to disconnect the two. And, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the, the Marvel movies are just eye popping spectacles, but they also will be sort of annoyingly, uh, you know, to overuse the term woke. Um, and so, you know, what what can you do, really, if, if you want to see something, unless you resign yourself to sort of um, indie dramas or something, uh, if you want an impressive cinematic experience, it seems almost impossible to avoid the kind of Disney, Marvel, you know, at least low-key progressive zeitgeist at the same time. Um, I mean, that's right. And and I think, you know, there's that, that expression I wrote about desertification of signs and men, and I think you, you can see it in the cinema that really, you know, the kind of 
if we if we look back at films, you know, great films of the past, they were about so many more different, you know, topics really, and so many different themes, which are no no longer really touched upon at all. And um, you know, they, so we, we've kind of we've kind of got this hollow, hollowing out of entertainment of of the arts, where it's now just about politics, you know, in a kind of a kind of extremely formulaic way where they say, OK, they've got to have the representation on the screen, you've got to have this act, you know, actors from these ethnicity, ethnicities and these uh, maybe got to have a trans actor or something, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and it's not it's not really about, um, you know, art, I think, at, at all at that point. Really. It's, it's a kind of it's an extremely formulaic exercise. And um, you know, I I don't know how how much further really cinema can go in that direction. You know, um, if, it, if we don't have films which are actually thematically rich in in the way that I would consider, you know, thematic uh, thematic richness, then I, I think people just switch off and they just won't accept for the diehard you know Marvel fans. People will find their, uh, you know, their thrills elsewhere. That's uh, that's what I, I see anyway. Yeah, I think we're kind of at the beginning of, you know, a real kind of shattering and dispersion of of the way that people consume uh, entertainment. It's it's becoming sort of idiosyncratic, and you know, the sort of like central movie experience or central music experience. Um, it's all being sort of cut up and compartmentalized and spread across different sort of niche domains. You know, you have Twitch streamers or uh, crypto enthusiasts or, um, you know, OnlyFans. I don't know. I mean, all music exists and cinematic style things exist even within some of that. Um, but there's no one big cultural main page for everyone to be referring to now. I just don't know how much cinema per se will matter in the future. Um, but audiovisual entertainment will continue, you know. Did either of you see the concluding or maybe not concluding entry in the Halloween franchise? No. How is it? Well, it was it was interesting to see a film that's ticketed as being the conclusion of one of these endless sort of undead IP franchises that you know, I tend to read as like, you know, they're, they're about the undead because they are undead. They're sort of, you know, they're just this kind of endlessly renewable thing. So so the film is analogous to the figure of Michael Myers. But yeah, what was really interesting about about it to me is that it it um, it lays over this sort of second plot uh, in which there's a kind of new Michael Myers figure, except he's innocent and he's a sort of unjustly persecuted uh, figure. And it it really almost, um, you know, this is kind of my, I, I've, I've had this idea of writing a sort of Rene Girardian reading of various major horror franchises, because I think one thing that's important about them is that you have to actually believe for them to work, you have to believe in the guilt of, of you know, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, whoever. And so when you start doing this thing of saying, oh, maybe he was driven to it by circumstances beyond his control. Maybe he was, he was, um, maybe he was innocent and falsely accused. Maybe he was, you know, suddenly, and, and just to go off on a slight tangent, I mean, the, the Freddy Krueger thing is really interesting because you know, he's we find out in the course of the original Nightmare on Elm Street that he's he's been murdered by a lynch mob of parents. Right. And so, you know, this, of course, comes at the same time as like the satanic panic and all of that. So, you know, it's it's not inconceivable to imagine a version of the story in which this is an innocent man. Right. Who was who was murdered by these these enraged parents um, who believe he's abusing their children and you know that and that and then you know this fact is covered up right in the community he's this this there's been this mob killing right there's been this this mass lynching of this this man 
and then you know he returns in in the dreams of these characters and then they sort of eventually confront the parents who tell them what really happened right so there's there's always at that point kind of a, a different version of the story you can imagine where in fact the killer is innocent right um and in some ways the dream and in some way the dreams are actually some kind of strange secondary manifestation of like the bad conscience of the parents or, or something along those lines so anyway what was interesting about halloween ends is that it really and i'm i'm spoiling it here but you know it i mean it doesn't exactly redeem it doesn't redeem michael myers per se but it does create this kind of michael myers successor figure who is who is presented as this innocent scapegoat right who's been victimized by this community um specifically falsely accused of killing a child right and and so it 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 almost retracts the entire um, the the entire sort of ethos of of various of these genres, right? Because the killer has to be guilty, right? The killer cannot be, <laughs> you know, uh, cannot be sort of exonerated in this way for the the basic framework of this type of slasher film to work. And so I don't know that there was something interesting about that in terms of the uh it, it seemed to express you know clearly halloween is like one of the most ridiculous examples of a a sort of overly sequelized movie uh franchise but you know it, it seemed striking this kind of almost overt sort of retraction of the the guiding premise of the franchise um although not i mean i wouldn't say entirely overt right it's um but but it's it's not difficult to to read it that way and so I don't know that that just struck me as sort of I mean there I think there are things going on in the horror franchise that have been sort of interesting like you know there's been this sort of uh, wave in the past ten years of sort of art you know sort of art house horror that are all made by the you know the Jordan Peele movies um, the Ari Aster movies uh, you know and they're all made by the same uh, production company I wish I, whose name is slipping my mind. Um, called Blumhouse, but I think it's not exactly top. Right. Not it's not at Jordan Peele or like eight twenty four type. Okay, thing. yeah, right, right, right. But so I don't know. There's some sort of, um, I, you know, I I think horror is always an interesting barometer of the culture, and uh, that that did strike me as, and I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I I thought. Um, <sighs> The I thought I actually thought the the I I think it was quite quite successful. Um, Smile was was a pretty good horror movie. Oh yeah, it was quite popular. Um, I thought I thought Barbarian was okay. It wasn't it 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 wasn't quite as good. It was a little too full of itself. Um, uh, but but yeah, I thought I thought I thought Smile was was successful just as a. A, a good, you know, more or less straight version of the genre um, that have this kind of body horror element. You know, maybe I uh, I spent too much time on on Twitter and I've, I've been too politicized, but I actually thought when I first heard of that movie Smile that it was kind of taking the uh, the feminist trope of don't tell me to smile to like horror dimensions, you know? Like I, th <laughs> I thought that someone was yeah. on a page killing people who were telling them to smile or something like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, I, I suppose some might, I mean, I never read any of the sort of um, the critical assessments of it, but because yeah, movie... I, I suppose some might read it that way. But no, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a movie about contagion. So it's kind of, you know, it's interesting. And oh, I see. In light of the pandemic, it's, it's, it's a kind of, um, you know, it's a movie about a smile that, uh, that uh, comes to inhabit you and uh kills you i mean it's probably most similar to it follows in its basic premise which which i think is quite a good movie um, yeah I, I i think i might also be influenced by that 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 film men that came out earlier this year which was very uncomfortable and uh, i don't know if you saw that it's, i did yeah i i thought it was better than i expected um, yeah i mean well i i definitely it was not forgettable you know, I, I can absolutely say that. And it's it's weird because the, the, that was during a period I hadn't seen too many movies. And then I saw Men and then Top Gun Maverick like a few days later. So it's just the most ridiculous juxtaposition. But yeah.